So, welcome to my world. All of my little technical challenges. Um, but it's like Brother Copeland talked many years ago about, uh, he had a, a, a tape, well, it wasn't a tape series. Well, it was a tape series. It was about four tapes. And it was called Excellence in Ministry. And it was all about the goal of doing your absolute best for the Lord, even technically. Um, which, I mean, boy, talk about preaching in the choir. Uh, it was really great for me to hear. And so ever since then, I've always tried to strive for that in excellence of ministry in terms of the audio and the video. I mean, literally, as Pastor has said you know, before, we've, we've had other pastors from other churches say, you know, what do you guys do for your video? You know, it's just so incredible. It's HD and it's this, that, and the other. And he's like, well, it's a 300-buck camera, and there's a guy sitting out there just doing this, you know. And hardly anybody believes it because, you know, we just get such good quality from what we're doing. But it's just all the little tricks and things that I've learned along the way trying to do my program. So it really is, has been a blessing that all that's working out so well. And we, we have so many viewers out there across the, literally the world. It is almost staggering in a way to think about, you know, sometimes when I'm at, at home editing it together to put out and then have to upload it. Uh, it's like if I'm late, I'm like, oh, those people are waiting. <laughs> so anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, all righty. Well, we will get started here. Um, if I have forgot any announcements or anything I'm supposed to have said, sorry. But we'll jump right in here. Um, one of the things that I'm always reminded of when I am uh, teaching and trying to do all these other things is the importance of helps ministry to take the pressure and the load off of the pastor so that he doesn't have to think about is the audio working, is the camera working, what about the lights, is the heat right, you know, all those kinds of things that can so preoccupy you that it diminishes how much you're concentrating on the word. So um, as a person who is involved in helps, uh, it really tells me and illustrates how important it is what we do for him uh, to keep everything moving, flowing. And as we expand the ministry, as he's talked about, you know, uh, starting another church down the road, elsewhere, um, you know, I'm frankly believing for the wisdom and the knowledge and the people that we're going to need to pull that off uh, because he will be somewhere it's like Sunday morning and then have to come here. I suspect for some period of time there will be those of us who have to be there and then come back over here <laughs> and have everything ready and be able to hit the ground running whenever all this happens. Um, so, you know, more people, more growth, more people in the helps ministry, uh, all of those things are something we ought to be praying about and believing for. So, uh, good stuff. All right, let's open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. Tonight we're going to be talking about this kind of a, a good uh, topic based on what we were just talking about about helps ministry and the importance of helps ministry and that is faithfulness faithfulness Proverbs 28 verse 20 a faithful man shall abound with blessings but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent <laughs> now I think that last part is something that is borne out by what we've seen in the news quite a bit uh, people that make haste to be rich shall not be innocent. They tend to get involved in things, get under pressure to do things that are not upright, not uh, something that would honor the Lord, let's put it that way. Uh, but it doesn't say we shouldn't be working toward riches because God gives us the power to get wealth in order to establish his covenant in the earth. But I think there the motivation is the key. We, we're doing it in order to have the finances to preach the gospel. 
whether that's uh, equipment, whether that's things that we need to minister around the world, all of that requires money. So there's nothing wrong with the money side of things. But if you make haste to be rich, you fall into that area of trying to do it in a way that isn't a blessing. Let's put it that way. Uh, but the first part of this verse is what I really want to look at. A faithful man shall abound with blessings. So a path to blessings, which I think everybody wants is to be blessed, uh, is faithfulness. And really that's what we, what we want to get into is faithfulness. To really look at that in some detail, let's go to Matthew 25, New Testament, book of Matthew 25, and Jesus here tells a parable. Um, let's see where we want to start. Verse 14, let's start there. That's a good place. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and to, delivered unto them his goods. Now, before we kind of really get into it, kind of set some, some background here. This guy is obviously wealthy. He's rich. He has servants. That's one thing that indicates his wealth and riches. Uh, but not only that, he obviously trusts his servants. He trusts them with his worldly goods. And, and for whatever reason, he's going to have to give them his goods while he's gone. Okay? So he gave to one in verse 15. He gave uh, five talents to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability. So he looked at his servants, he said, now not all of these servants have similar abilities. Now, you know, I've said this before, it's no, it's no real <laughs> secret. I'm not the world's best at math. Math and I have a mere passing acquaintance. Uh, and I've had a lot of people tell me, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine at work that tells me, you know, I just don't understand how you can be only fair at math when you're a computer guy. You know, you work with all this technical stuff all day long. And I said, well, here's the thing. Don't mistake lack of ability in one area to be an indicator of intellect or lack of intellect in another area. Uh, people have talents. They have abilities. They have things that they're simply good at. Math is one of those areas I'm just not that good at and frankly don't really have the interest, which is probably the key right there, you know. If I were a math guy and thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread and was really excited about solving quadratic equations, I'm sure I'd be really thrilled, but not my cup of tea. So, uh, you know, talents can vary. Abilities can vary. and. Uh, this guy was obviously aware that some of his servants had more abilities than others. So he gave them his finances, his wealth, to manage according to their several ability and straightway took his journey. When he'd received the five ta he that received the five talents went and traded with the same and made another five talents. Now, here's the thing. He had five talents, talent being a measure of finances. We'd say dollars or however you want to say it. But it was, uh, it was some amount of money. He doubled it. Well, that's pretty impressive to double your money. I and mean, I guarantee you put it in the bank these days, you're going to get less than a percent. You know, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Back when I was young, you could put money in a bank and actually earn a fairly decent amount of interest, but not these days. So, you know, he doubled what he was given, which is pretty good. That's impressive. Uh, he received, let's see, Let me back up, yeah, yeah. verse 15, and, uh, he gave one five talents to another two to another one, every man according to his several ability. Then verse 16, when he that received the five talents went and traded with the same, he made them another five talents. Likewise, he that received two, he gained another two, so he doubled it. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. So he did not do what his Lord asked him to do because what the master had asked him to do was to manage his money. Manage means increase it. 
do something useful with it, not stick it in the ground. After a long time, so this was a period of time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And he that had received the five talents came and brought the other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He was faithful because he did what he was asked to do. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now, it's obvious to me that this parable is indicative of our serving the Lord and what's going to happen with us as we go into heaven, enter thou into the joy of your Lord. You know, I mean, this is, this is a tremendous promise. So, verse 22, he also that received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained another two talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, and notice, he didn't say, you know, you didn't do as well as the other guy. The other guy made me five talents. You just made me two. He didn't say that. He said exactly the same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the Lord, joy of thy Lord. The exact same thing. But if you think about it, one was given five, he got five. The other one was given two, he got two. By percentage, he had, both of them had doubled it. Okay? So they literally had done very well. They'd done as basically uh, each as well as the other. Uh, the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. So then in verse 24, he says, Then he that received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. Reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. What's he doing? He's not managing the guy's money that he was given. He's being critical. He's saying, you know, I knew you were a thief and a cheat and knucklehead and so forth and so on. And you mean and all this kind of stuff. I mean, he didn't have anything good to say about his master. Um, that's not faithfulness. As a matter of fact, it's critical. And it is exactly opposite of the relationship that we should be having with the Lord. And, you, you know, the, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would hear this and say, well, hey, Dr. Bill, I mean, come on. I'm not going to tell God you're mean and you're hateful and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Not in so many words. But when you come against leadership like pastor of the church or those that are in authority or even your own boss, wherever you work, and, you know, you're griping and you're complaining and you're telling other employees, you know, can you believe what they did to us and so forth and so on? Watch that you don't reap what you sow, okay? That's not faithfulness. And what we're seeing out of this message, I'm, I'm getting just a bit ahead of myself here, but I want you as we look at this message and the, and the meaning of it, keep it in the back of your mind. What's the point of this message? The point is faithfulness. The points that Jesus is trying to tell them, God honors faithfulness. So, let's keep reading. He said, well, you know, I, I knew all these things about you. Verse 25, and I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast what is thine. So here, I'm giving it back to you. You can see the attitude. You know, I didn't take anything, but I ain't going to do nothing with it. So here. You know. Now, the Lord answered and said in him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Now notice, he didn't deny it. He said, You're right. I do those things. Now see, he's not saying you are wrong. And see, this is a, another point that I think we miss when we read this, this story, this parable, is uh, in reading it, we tend to think, well, you know, this can't be talking about God because God wouldn't have done these things. Well, that's really kind of not the point. The point is, in the story of a master and his servants, the servant had some gripes. They were obviously legitimate gripes. Okay? I mean, he didn't argue with him and say, you're wrong about me. He basically said, you're right about me. <laughs> but your attitude, your attitude personally is wrong. 
You may be right about me and the way I conduct my affairs and my business, but that doesn't change how you operate toward me. And that's really the point of the message here that Jesus is, is telling in this parable is we can only deal with our attitude, our servanthood, okay? Our ability to serve and to be faithful. I can't affect how my boss thinks or feels or what he does toward me in the sense that I can't flip a switch or pull a lever or do whatever to make him or her different. Um, I can believe the word. I can pray for them. I can intercede. I can do a lot of things in the spiritual realm, but their will ultimately is involved. And if they want to be a knucklehead, they're going to be a knucklehead, okay? There's not a lot I can do about that, but I can do anything with me because I'm ultimately responsible only for me, not for him or her, okay? So what I have to do is I have to examine myself. Remember what the Bible says, if you will judge yourself, you won't be judged. I'd rather be the one judging myself. I'd rather be the one saying, you know, I got some issues here. You know, I, I have something I need to deal with. Lord, help me with this. I repent. If I said anything wrong, did anything wrong, I can deal with me. And if I'll deal with me and be faithful to what I've been asked to do, God rewards faithfulness. Remember, the faithful man will increase in his blessings. Well, blessings come from the Lord. You know, if we get financial blessing, financial wherewithal, that's great, but ultimately it comes from the Lord. So that's the source. And the key to that is, the key to those blessings multiplying is faithfulness. So in dealing with my boss and dealing with my work, my job, I was telling uh, Ben and Belinda today at, at, at supper about a few things that's going on at work and that aren't going quite the way I want them to go. You know, there are decisions being made up the ladder that I wish would go a different way. But I can't do anything about changing that other than, you know, as a computer professional, I can make clear what I think should happen if I'm asked in a meeting, and I can graciously and kindly and purposefully explain those things, but ultimately when the decision's made and they come back and say, we need you to do this, I need to do that because I'm a faithful employee, and they're the way I even told somebody this in a situation at work where they were about to do something that was truly not wise and I knew it wasn't wise, and I was frustrated with it. But I told a, a friend of mine there at work, I said, here's the thing. All the computers that we're working on, not a one of them's mine. The whole network there, not a wire in it's mine. Um, what we're doing there in terms of running the hospital, none of that's mine. You know, I've got areas of responsibility there to keep certain things running and certain things going and all that. I just need to do what I'm supposed to do. You know, the old thing about keeping nose to the grindstone? Well, that basically means concentrate and stick with what you're supposed to do. Well, in a way, that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. I can tell them what I believe is the consequence of an issue, but once they've made a decision, I have to say, well, your toys, you just let me play with them, you know. If that's what you want to do, that's what we'll do. And uh, a lot of decisions ultimately come to find out I had a few good points and it didn't quite go the way it should have gone. But again, I don't go back to them and say, see, I told you. Again, what's the attitude? Gets back to that third servant. He had a bad attitude. I told you so will not gain you points at work. Okay, and it, it, to be honest, it's also not faithfulness. It's not kind. It's not what a Christian would do in that position. Okay, so what I do is, again, if they say, why do you think this went the way it went? I would say, well, you know, there's this reason, this reason, this reason. We discussed that, uh, but we went a different way, and that's fine. 
but maybe next time we can do it a little differently, you know, whatever. Make the point so they learn from something, but not do it in such a way that it is vindictive and hurtful. Because it not only will not make points to cause it from not happening again, it will hurt you. It will cut short your blessing. So, just words to the wise. Um, so, he goes on and says here in verse 27, Thou oughtest therefore put my money to the exchangers, that then in my coming I would have received mine own with usury. Now that's good old King James. Put it in our vernacular. You should have taken my money and put it in the bank and at least I'd have gotten some interest. Okay? Now granted, it may not be these days a whole lot of interest, but it would have been more than just getting back what he gave him. Even if it was a half of a percent, it's that much. Because apparently he was gone a while. He was gone long enough that even a small amount of interest would have been something. But he didn't even do that. So he didn't even manage it even that well. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him that hath the ten talents. Now notice, he gave it to the guy that managed it better. He gave it to the guy that had more ability. He gave it to the guy that earned him more money. That's just good business sense, okay? It may sound like, well, you know, why didn't he split it between the two of the guys? Because they both doubled his money. But he gave it to the guy, literally, as he said earlier, I'm giving it to you based on your abilities. So he gave it to him. For, and then Jesus makes his point of his message. Unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon his throne of glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he goes on to talk about the sheep and the goats, and the sheep and goats' judgment, and all those things. But the point is, that we're making here, is the unprofitable servant was cast into outer darkness. Now, I don't want to be an unprofitable servant. <laughs> Now, praise the Lord, he's, he's telling the story to make a spiritual point. We can't take the message too far and say, oh my goodness, that means if I don't do a good job in church, I'm going to hell. No, no. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that faithfulness is something that God values. And, uh, I, and I've told Belinda this for years. You know, it's funny what you think about when my mom passed away and I was trying to think about, you know, what should I have said about her at her funeral? And we talked about a lot of different things about her. And I thought about, you know, what are, what are people going to say about me? You know, if, if, I'm, uh, if I go home be with the Lord before the Lord comes back, you know, which probably he's coming before the end because it's going to be a long time. But at any rate, what are all people saying about me when they're standing around talking? And I told her the key thing, the, the thing that stays at the top of my mind all the time is he was faithful. That's what I want people to think. That's what I want people to say. That's what I want the Lord to think is that if nothing else, he may have made mistakes. He may could have done this, that, or the other better, and I could. But if nothing else, he's faithful. He was there in and out and day and night and whatever, come anything, he was there. And so that's been a key for me. And there's been times in my life that when things happen that I know could have gone better, could have gone a different way, I'll remind myself of that. I'll remind myself, well, I could have done better in these areas, but by George, I was faithful, <laughs> you know, at least I got that going. And so, and I'm not, I'm not bragging on me at all, I'm just saying what my motivation is, okay? This is, just give you a little insight, really into the, the, the gist of the message tonight, is faithfulness. It's been a key to me, because I see in the scriptures, and we're going to look at a few more scriptures here, it's not going to be very long, but just a few scriptures here to illustrate how important faithfulness is to the Lord, what it means to him. 
So that's the parable of the talents. Let's go to uh, another telling of uh, the parable of the talents, I believe it is. Let's go to Luke 19. I know there is a version in Luke. I'm actually not sure it is the same story. So let me go down here. It's kind of a short version. <laughs> Let's look at verse 12. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He called his ten servants, so this time it was ten servants, delivered unto them ten pounds, said unto them, Occupy till I come. I like that. I think that's what the church ought to be doing, is occupy till he comes. But his citizens hated him and sent a message to him, saying, We will not have this man reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having uh, received the kingdom, when he commanded these servants, he called unto them to receive uh, to whom he had given money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Uh, they then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. He said unto him, Well done, good, ser uh, good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, thou hast authority over ten cities. Praise the Lord. The second came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came and said, Lord, here is thy pound. I have kept it up in a napkin. <laughs> For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up where thou layest not down, and reapest where thou didst not sow. And he said unto them, Out of own, thy own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherewith then gavest not my money to the bank, that at my coming I would have required my own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given from him which hath not, even that, uh, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them bring hither and slay them before me. This guy was kind of tough. And when he had thus spoken, he went and sent it up into Jerusalem. And goes on to tell, tell what all uh, Jesus did after that. But basically another version of the story. And the thing about it is, and this is, uh, I don't know if you've ever <laughs> noticed this. I'm sure you have. That uh, when pastor gives a message, maybe a few Sundays later, he'll maybe, maybe use the exact same story to illustrate something else. But it's a little different. Well, same thing with Brother Copeland. I've heard him tell stories of different things he's done in his life, and it's always going to be just a little different. Same thing here with Jesus. He tells a story in one city to make the point. He tells it a little differently in another city to make the point. Fine. But the point again here is faithfulness. What as a servant did you do with what the Lord gave you to do? So let's look at 1 Corinthians 4.2. And actually, let's begin in verse 1. Just back one verse up here. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ. He's talking to preachers, ministers here. And stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, remember, steward is what we were talking about with those guys that had the talents from their master. Okay, now we're, when we use the word talent, we typically think of things like playing the guitar, playing the piano, musical talent or ability. In their case, the word talent was a form of money, coinage, or, or whatever of some kind. But you can, you can extrapolate from that that if you have talents and abilities, you should be a good minister of those talents and abilities. You know, I would love to be able to, i tell you the truth, I would love to be able to play bass guitar. I just had that bass guitar vibe, you know. I'd love to just stand there, boom, 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 you know, and just be mellow. And, you know, I could just do that. I, I, I like that. And I've also been a fan of bass licks, you know. So um, I tell you what, this is totally not spiritual, okay. <laughs> We're going to take the not spiritual part of the program tonight. But there is... 
Um, there's a song by uh, Phil Simon. I believe it's Paul Simon. I'm sorry, Paul Simon. <laughs> Thinking somebody else. Paul Simon, and the song is. Uh, can't remember the name of it, but it's got a line in it that says, uh, uh, you know, I'll call you Betty and you call me Al. Have you, you know that song? You know what I'm talking about? What's that? Call me Al. Yeah, that's the name of the song. Okay, there you go. Call me Al. There's one part of that song where this guy does a bass lick. And I, I listen to that and go, Dude, that is so cool. <laughs> you know, the song is completely silly. And if you've ever seen the video, Chevy Chase is sitting there beside him and they're going through this whole stupid little routine and he's taking a glass and dropping it into a, what looks like a glass table, but there's no glass in it. So the glass goes through and hits the floor. I mean, just crazy stuff. But that bass lick is awesome. <laughs> so I'd love to be able to play bass, bottom line. And uh, I even tried to learn how once. I took a little guitar in college, and I know a little bit, just enough to be barely dangerous. But I just never had the patience, you know, to really learn it. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to be a bass player. But if I was, it would be so fun to get up there and play bass. I would use my talent for the Lord as best I could and be faithful with that, okay? And uh, in my case, my talents lie in electronics and video and audio and all the things that I do at the church, you know. And I enjoy it, and, I, and I'm blessed to do it, praise the Lord. But uh, the key is to do what you can do and do it the best you can. I don't want to be the servant that hides the talent in the ground or in a napkin, you know. I want to be the servant that actually uses his ability and, you know, even if I've only got two and I double it, I doubled it, you know. Uh, if I'm, I've got more than one talent and I double that, great. But that's what being a good steward is all about. So here it says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Amen. That a man be found faithful. And so I have said many times, the one thing I want is to be found faithful. And the thing about being found faithful, this is just a, a, an aside, but uh, you're not found faithful unless somebody's looking for faithfulness. You know what I mean? You find something when you look for it. And that means I'm not standing up, tooting my horn, and saying, look at me, look what I'm doing. You know, you got to find me being faithful because I'm doing it in the background. That's my point, okay, with regard to that. And that is, otherwise you get into pride. Look at me, and look what I'm doing. And that's certainly not the point of what I'm talking about here tonight. What I'm doing is encouraging you to use your talents and abilities, whatever they may be. You know, you may have a talent in the area of managing money, okay? Use that somehow for the Lord. Find a way, pray, and find a way that you can do that. Maybe you need to uh, be the person that runs the bookstore and takes care of the money there. I don't know. But you can do it in such a way that, that it'll bless the church, bless pastor, and manage that money. And it just may be that one area, but you double it. You know, you're a good steward with it. Maybe, uh, you know, you, can, you are the best cake baker and maker in the church. And every time we have an event, you make this really cool cake. And everybody goes, wow, I love those cakes. Well, that's doubling your talent. So it's an opportunity. Be found faithful. Be doing the faithful thing because you just do it. You're not asked necessarily. You're just doing it. And then they go, you know, they're faithful. You're, they, you, you're found out <laughs> for your faithfulness. So that's, that's a scripture that I think about with regard to faithfulness. I want to be found faithful. I want somebody to think, wow, you know, he always, he gets those videos out every single week, week after week after week. 
after week, after year, after year. Well, praise the Lord, you know. And it apparently blesses some folks. So it's a way of doubling talents. Now again, please don't think that I'm saying this to toot my horn. It's not my point. But the point is, whatever your area is, whatever your talent is, you can do something. Last scripture. I told you it's going to be short. 1 Timothy 1 and 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now notice here, Paul is talking to Timothy, who is his son in the faith, who is a young minister, Timothy is, and Paul, the elder minister, is telling him, the younger minister, here's the thing. I want to thank Jesus Christ our Lord who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who before was a blasphemer, I'm talking about Paul here, and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy, be, obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. See, this is before he was born again. He did it ignorantly. He did it in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now notice what he thought of himself. I heard a minister say this recently, and it really blessed me. I think it may have been Keith Moore. I love listening to Keith Moore. And Keith Moore, I believe it was, made this point. He said, um, actually, no, I'll take that back. I do love Keith Moore, but it wasn't Keith Moore. It was uh, Andrew Womack that said this. He was talking about Paul, who of anyone understood, because he's the one that told us in the Scripture that we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and that we need to confess that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and that we're not to identify ourselves as sinners. We're not to say, you know, well, I'm, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Well, I was an old sinner. I got saved by grace. Now I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Paul taught that his whole ministry. That was, his, that was the gist of his whole ministry. But that Paul here said, Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Well, now see, we jump on that and say, Paul, that's a bad confession. But Paul's point was not, I'm still a sinner. His point was, I was the chiefest of sinners. I, I came against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I persecuted. Jesus told him, you're persecuting me. I mean, that's pretty bad. When Jesus himself comes to you and says, you know, boy, get saved or go to hell now. You know, I mean, that Mr. T anointing came on him. <laughs> well, the thing is, that if Jesus appears to you and tells you that personally, I kind of think that would have an effect on you in terms of your perception of what you did to him. I'm sure he probably thought, oh my goodness, what I did. And even in like his later years, even after he'd been in the ministry, and even after he got the revelation that he got about righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, all those things, there was still part of him that could hear Jesus saying, you're persecuting me. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He knew what he had done. Now, he still didn't identify with that on an ongoing basis. He still knew he was the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He still said all that he did about that uh, he was delivered from all the things that came against him and so forth and so on. Don't get me wrong. But here in getting this across to Timothy, he could say, among all sinners I am chief, howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, verse 16, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering or patience for a pattern, in other words, a pattern or an example, just like, type and shadow, so to, sport, so to speak, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 
And then I love these next scriptures. There's a song that comes from verse 17 to the end of the chapter. Or, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, it's just verse 17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And in my early charismatic days, when we'd have the home Bible studies, and I would have my auto harp, and another brother across the room would have his guitar. We would sing and play. And one of the songs we did here was, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Simple little song. But it's scripture. I love singing scripture. And it was so uplifting. We get into doing that and we do it as a round. And we get that thing going and we be playing. And it was beautiful to hear and ministered to you so much. But his point here is. All praise be unto the Lord. He is the one that is immortal, eternal, invisible, the only wise God. Be honor and glory to him forever and ever. And Paul kept in mind that's why he was saved from the position he was in. And all of this you know, that we've led into here stemmed from the fact that what he said up here earlier when he said he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Here's a guy that by all rights should not have been in the ministry by human standards. You know what I'm saying? You'd look at him and say, man, I couldn't trust you. Look what you did to my church. But Jesus redeemed him and then at that point put him into the ministry. He said, I'm going to show him the things he must suffer for my name's sake because he's going to be in the ministry. He's going to be my frontline man. I'm going to trust him with two-thirds of the New Testament revealed through him. And i got to believe that it was because he was faithful to do what he was asked to do. And that's, that's where I want us to be, is to be faithful to do what God asks us to do. I don't think he's going to ask us to be stoned and shipwrecked and all the things that Paul went through. I mean, maybe some, I don't know. I don't think he will, though. It's just in our daily lives here today, we don't typically run into those situations. But situations you do run into, good opportunities to be faithful. I run into opportunities at work to share the gospel, share what the Word of God says. People think I'm a nut, but, you know, they're going to think I'm a nut anyway. Might as well be a nut for the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Because um, I'm just an odd character. So I don't mind but I can share the word with them. Same thing with where you are at your job or school or wherever you're at. You may be odd to a lot of folks, but you're the one they come to and ask, what do you think? Oh, by the way, you were talking about that yesterday, about some scripture. What was that scripture? You know, I mean, you've got opportunities.